In 1985, at the height of the Iran-Iraq War, all-round American patriot Colonel Oliver North met with Iranian businessmen in a hotel room in Frankfurt. One of the things that we would like to do, okay, is we would like to become actively engaged in ending this war in such a way that it becomes very evident to everybody that the real problem in preventing peace in the region is Saddam Hussein, and we'll act to take care of that. In the prelude to the Gulf War, it was easy to think that Iraq had only just been invented, that there was nothing much to say about it as a country, that there was nothing much there to bomb. In fact, the history being arranged for us was played out in the land where all written history began. For whilst Europe was populated with Stone Age tribes, the people of Mesopotamia were living in towns, and those towns had libraries. The city of Babylon flourished for 2,000 years, changing hands as rival empires fought over trade routes, riches, land. It was here a legal code was written that the strong might not oppress the weak. 20 centuries before the birth of Christ, these laws had distinguished justice from revenge. Centuries later, another great city was built, capital of the Arab Empire and its new religion, Islam. Rhymed poetry, geometry, our number system, all come from Baghdad. Here, in Europe's dark age, Arab scholars calculated the circumference of the earth. Six centuries later, the church conceded it was not flat. The Crusades launched against Islam did not reach Baghdad. By the time the Europeans came, the Christian nations had colonized the globe. Who, the Africans asked, has not seen the simpering grey men with their flags. In World War I, the Ottoman Empire was defeated and the Allies moved in. With a League of Nations mandate, the region was divided between French and British rule. Palestine was declared a Jewish homeland. A line in the sand made Kuwait a state, but Kurdish dreams of nationhood were less convenient. Having promised self-rule, Britain occupied Iraq and stayed there. Resistance was discouraged with bombs and mustard gas. When independence finally came in 1932, power was handed to a puppet king. Western companies had just begun to export Iraq's oil. But across the map to Iraq, another dangerous spot that Britain dealt with before it was too late. Iraq 1941. Saddam Hussein is four, born into the cauldron of post-colonial rule. Iraq is still the prisoner of the West's will. After World War II, Europe needed American loans to rebuild. A World Bank was founded and the League of Nations replaced. We, the people of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. But the Security Council, controlled by the Allies, was deadlocked in superpower rivalries. Policy advisers set out Washington's goals. We have about 60% of the world's wealth, but only 6.3% of its population. Our real task in this position is to devise a pattern of relationships which will permit us to maintain this disparity. We should cease to talk about such vague and unreal objectives as human rights, the raising of living standards, and democratization. In 1958, there was a revolution in Iraq. The new prime minister, Abdel Qasim, began to nationalize the oil fields. We are fighting, he declared, for the industrialization of our republic and an end to our dependence on the sale of crude oil. Washington had other plans, deciding that the opposition Ba'ath Party was the political force of the future. The CIA met with activists, including Saddam Hussein. In the coup that followed, thousands were arrested tortured and killed. Kasim himself suffered a terminal illness before a firing squad. 
but in 1972, the Ba'ath government nationalized Iraq's oil. OPEC was wresting control from the West. As prices rose, America threatened to invade the Gulf, prompting Kuwait and Saudi Arabia to mine their oil fields. But since a clash with the Soviets was inadvisable, more discreet methods of management were found. Working with the Shah of Iran, the CIA funneled weapons to Kurdish rebels in Iraq. Neither government wished the Kurds to win the war that followed. They merely hoped to ensure a level of hostilities high enough to sap the resources of Iraq. Baghdad conceded to Iranian border demands. The Shah closed the frontier to the rebels. American aid was withdrawn and the Kurds forced to surrender. Covert actions, Kissinger explained, should not be confused with missionary work. Repression intensified as Iraq moved towards dictatorship, but Western companies vied for business as the Ba'ath Party began to spend. Oil revenues were invested in the country and a modern infrastructure built. Roads, hospitals, clean water, power. Food was subsidized, healthcare and education free. Kassim's vision of an independent nation was within reach. In 1977, Senator Henry Jackson's report to the Natural Resources Committee advised that the defense of the oil resources of the Gulf constitutes one of the most vital and enduring interests of the United States. Iran had provided a cover for American influence, but that was about to change. In 1979, the Shah was overthrown and the Ayatollah Khomeini swept to power in an Islamic revolution. Tensions flared as he denounced America and the new president of Iraq, Saddam Hussein. After months of border skirmishes, Iraq invaded. Years of bloody trench warfare followed. Iran attacked with human waves of soldiers, some as young as 14, and Iraq used chemical weapons. But despite an international arms ban, Britain, France, and both superpowers supplied military equipment to the Iraqi regime. Since Saddam Hussein was uh aligned against the Ayatollah Khomeini and the Iranians. We gave them everything. A nervous Kuwait and Saudi Arabia bankrolled Iraq throughout the war, and the US bombed Iranian ships and oil platforms. But America was also sending arms to Iran. In 1988, the Iranians captured the Kurdish town of Halabja. Iraq counterattacked with nerve gas, and 5,000 people were killed. Exiled Kurds staged a hunger strike at the UN to draw attention to this atrocity, but no vital or enduring interest was shown. The following year, America sold Iraq raw materials for chemical weapons, and Britain sponsored an arms fair in Baghdad. The West, as Britain's defense minister acknowledged, had been well served by Iran and Iraq fighting each other. By the time the war ended, 800,000 young men were dead. And Iraq, which had started the war with reserves of $30 billion, was now $80 billion in debt. One day after the ceasefire, Kuwait announced plans to increase oil exports in defiance of OPEC quotas. The price of crude began to slide. In June 1989, they stepped up production again. Iraq was hard hit. For every fall of a dollar in the price of a barrel of oil, Iraq lost a billion dollars in income. Whilst Iraq was at war, Kuwait had moved into the Romalia oil field, shifting a border disputed since colonial times. In November, Kuwaiti officials met with the CIA and agreed to take advantage of the deteriorating economic situation in Iraq, to put pressure on that country's government to delineate our common border. The CIA gave us its view of appropriate means of pressure. As oil prices collapsed, Kuwait demanded that Iraq repay its wartime debts. In December, the United States invaded Panama without rebuke from the UN Security Council. The Soviet Empire was in chaos, 
the global pattern of relationships changing. US war plan 1002, devised to counter a Russian threat in the Gulf, was updated and now posed Iraq as the enemy. Early in 1990, General Norman Schwarzkopf briefed Congress. Middle East oil is the West's lifeblood. It is going to fuel us when the rest of the world has run dry. Schwarzkopf advocated a permanent US presence in the Gulf. But in the wake of Soviet collapse, there were calls to cut military spending. New enemies had to be found. A white paper was drawn up which identified Iraq and Saddam Hussein as the optimum contenders to replace the Warsaw Pact. There was just one problem. According to the US Army War College, Baghdad should not be expected to deliberately provoke military confrontations with anyone. US intelligence indicated that Iraq's desire was to reduce the army and repay their debts. But high unemployment made demobilization impossible. Inflation on the dinar was 40% and rising, and the price of oil continued to fall. In May 1990, Saddam Hussein protested at Kuwait's continuing overproduction. Were it possible, we would have endured. But I say that we have reached a point where we can no longer withstand pressure. The Kuwaitis were dismissive, as an American official recalled. When the Iraqis came and said, can't you do something about it? The Kuwaitis said, sit on it. And they didn't even say it nicely. They were arrogant. They were terrible. Charles Allen, the CIA's officer for warning, predicted that Iraq would invade Kuwait. His report was shelved. In a diplomatic offensive, Iraq sent envoys to Arab states until Kuwait agreed to a summit. On July 10th, new quotas were settled. On the 11th, Kuwait rejected them and announced plans to further increase production by October. Saddam Hussein's patience was exhausted. I think he came to believe that Kuwait was overproducing oil, not in its own interest, but because it was goaded into that by the United States in an effort to weaken Iraq. On July 15th, Iraq wrote to the Arab League and the UN Secretary General, listing their grievances. On the 17th, Saddam Hussein accused Kuwait of economic warfare. On the 18th, troops were sent to the border. Saddam Hussein summoned US Ambassador Glasby and asked her to clarify the American position. I have direct instructions from the President to seek better relations with Iraq. Our opinion is you should have the opportunity to rebuild your country, but we have no opinion on Arab-Arab conflicts, like your border disagreement with Kuwait. As the crisis escalated, King Hussein of Jordan went to Kuwait to try and broker a compromise, to be told, We are not going to respond. If they don't like it, let them occupy our territory. We are going to bring in the Americans. As Iraqi forces moved to the front line, the Assistant Secretary of State was questioned in Congress. If Iraq, for example, charged across the border into Kuwait, is it correct to say that we do not have a treaty commitment which would oblige us to engage US forces? That is correct. On the 2nd of August, Iraq invaded. Everyone, it seems, from the ordinary Kuwaiti in the street to the sophisticated planners in the Pentagon was taken by surprise by Saddam Hussein's strike at his tiny neighbor. Brutal aggression launched last night against Kuwait illustrates my central thesis. The world remains a dangerous place with serious threats to important U.S. interests. President Bush convened an emergency session of the Security Council. The invasion was condemned, sanctions levied, and Iraq's assets frozen the following day. Iraq was to suffer economic isolation and intense hardship until it relented. It was perhaps the most complete blockade of a country seen in recent times. The US State Department then sent a message to the countries of the Arab League. The West has done its duty, but the Arab nations are doing nothing. If they do not take a firm stand on the Kuwaiti affair, they can be sure that in the future, they will no longer be able to count on America. With the world united, hopes were high that the Security Council would now be an effective force for peace. Mr. 
President, this is a far more important issue than simply the invasion of Kuwait. This is, in its own way, the first real test of this new world order that we're trying to put together. But U.S. officials were pushing to get troops into the Gulf. The administration turned to Prince Bandar, the Saudi ambassador to the United States. Producing satellite photographs, they claimed that Iraqi troops were heading for the Saudi border and could attack within 48 hours. Permission was granted to base U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia. In fact, 40,000 troops were already on their way. Now warplanes were sent to join them. I took this action to assist the Saudi Arabian government in the defense of its homeland. Bush told Congress that 120,000 Iraqi troops had moved toward the Saudi border. DIA analysts, who saw Soviet satellite pictures, later commented, We didn't see anything to indicate an Iraqi force in Kuwait of even 20% the size the administration claimed. U.S. intelligence reported that troops were, in fact, pulling back into southern Iraq. Qatar might well have uh, not intended to invade Saudi Arabia, but there must have been great temptation. It was a period of great the vulnerability for you can get into Saudi Arabia and for our Israel and for Israel. In mid-August, three Iraqi peace proposals were made. The third was welcomed in a statement by the Saudis, urging Kuwait to negotiate. Two days later, the Saudis retracted it, as Air Force Chief of Staff Michael Dugan assured the press that We are positive for a joint attack. Initially, the deployment of American and other forces after the invasion was simply defensive. The President was quite chief, General Norman Schwarzkopf, ruled out any attempt to recover Kuwait by force. In the meantime, resolutions flowed from the Security Council. A blockade was sanctioned. Dependent on imported food, Iraq now faced starvation. On September 4, James Baker said that U.S. gold now included the destruction of Iraq's military. On September 15, Dugan said targets would include what is unique about Iraq and culture, that they put very high value on, that psychologically would make an impact. If push came to shove, the cutting edge would be downtown Baghdad. If I want to hurt you, it would be at home not out in the woods someplace. Over 100,000 troops were now stationed in the Gulf without congressional debate or authority, and the build-up continued. In the biggest operation since World War II, Western equipment and troops have been landing at the Saudi port of Jubail, less than 200 miles from Kuwait. Questions were asked. Why should the West defend a country which has no democracy? When he was gassing his own Kurdish people, when he was invading Iran, where were all the clever politicians then? And answers given. The president stated reasons vary from upholding international law to protecting oil fields, putting down a new hit. I don't believe they have the reason for security and saving an Their concern in the region is purely and simply oil. Our jobs, our way of life, our own freedom would all suffer if control of the world's we great oil reserve fell into the hands we fed him. of that one man, Saddam Hussein. We made him what he is. So it just isn't an energy secretary. Oil that Mr. Mr. Elliot felt it out. It's all about, oh, just wait. I watch and learn. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. The Diana president repeated the incubator story six times Diana in his verbal war against Saddam. Had kids in incubators and they were thrown 300 out babies had died, the president no said. But the girl who gave the testimony... ...wasn't just a simple Kuwaiti escapee. In fact, just a few seats away was her father, Kuwait's ambassador to the United States and Canada. A fact known to the organizers of the hearing. Citizens for a free Kuwait wanted to get public opinion behind a full-scale commitment, so they paid over $10 million to America's biggest public relations company, Hill & Knowlton, Inc. Which is about what it is for a presidential campaign. Most ordinary Americans didn't care about Kuwait. So the efforts were, what is it that we can do to emotionally motivate people to support actions through the UN to drive them out? Adam's power will only grow. The next conflict will find him stronger still, perhaps in possession even of nuclear weapons. Many still oppose.
opposed the war, and Congress had not voted. They, they were, were willing, willing to have a vote as long as the outcome was more or less certain to be uh, supportive of the administration. Bush doubled the troops to 400,000. I know in my heart of hearts that what we are doing is right. Unable to count on the support of Congress, the administration turned to the United Nations. If we could get the Soviet Union to agree to the use of force, China would not veto. It was decided that I would visit with each and every government on the uh, Security Council. Debts were written off. Loans granted to China, Russia, Israel, Iran. Incentives totaling $23 billion. Resolution 678 authorized the use of all necessary means to restore international peace and security in the area. It is at this stage quite impossible to determine in detail precisely what that may mean. This is a very bad precedent for security guns. Who knows who's next in line? Will those in favor of the draft resolution please raise their hands? China abstained and Yemen and Cuba actually voted against the resolution. Thank you. The draft resolution has been adopted as resolution 678. The next day, all U.S. aid to Yemen was cancelled. Secretary, thank you for bringing us very closely in contact with these realities. This meeting is adjourned. The United Nations can now play the kind of role we all have hoped for a long time it could play. Iraq was given until January 15th to withdraw. I have today directed the Secretary of Defense to increase the size of U.S. forces to ensure that the coalition has an adequate offensive military option. Since in the early days of the crisis to defend Saudi Arabia, it began to look as if they might be used to attack Iraq. Across the world, people demonstrated as the Allies readied for an assault. If there is an ideal time for war in the desert, it's before March, but that drastically shortens the time for sanctions to break. Shortly before the deadline, hopes were raised when Iraq's Foreign Minister, Harry Aziz, and the US Secretary of State, James Baker, met in Geneva. To go the extra mile for peace. Bush wrote a letter to Saddam Hussein. He read the letter, didn't say a word, and then he looked at me and he said, I cannot accept this letter. When it comes to the Arabs, there you raise the stick. With four States days to go, the Senate voted. The incubator story came up seven times. Time. On this vote, the yeas are 52, and the nays are 47. This will not be another Vietnam. We will not permit our troops to have their hands tied behind their backs. And I pledge to you, there will not be any murky ending. Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down. We're like the bullies of the world right now, do you know that? And the voice of the harpers shall be heard no more at all in thee. Throwing the pistol at the sheep herder's feet. And, and the, the light, light of, of the candle, candle shall shine no more at all in thee. Pick it up. This is CBS. This is PBS. This is ABC. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Good evening. The United States of America is at war. To begin with, the army occupying Kuwait would hardly be touched. Instead, targets all over Iraq would be obliterated. Imagine Iraq like a human body. What happens if you sever their spinal cord? They can't function, right? Tomahawk cruise missiles, F-14 Tomcats, devastating JP-233 bombs targeted the most intense aerial bombardment the world has ever known. 
American B-52s flying high above the reach of Iraqi fire. Casualties on the Iraqi side will be extremely high. Saddam Hussein must be seen to be the loser. This was tremendous. Baghdad was lit up like a Christmas tree. 1,300 sorties so far. The first airstrikes were probing, testing the efficiency of Baghdad's defenses. On Friday, the tactics changed to heavy saturation bombing. First 24 hours consisted of more attacks than the entire number of targets in the years 1942 and 1943 during the combined bomber offensive in Europe. Six minutes after the stealth bombers left, the cruise missiles arrived. Others dropped carbon filament to short the electrical grid system. American, British and Saudi bombers and fighters from air bases and carriers joined in a single concerted attack. There's uh, another wave of bombing just starting. This is the first time anybody's seen a war like this. Britain still hasn't formally declared war on Iraq. Apparently the Foreign Office nowadays considers it a bit old-fashioned. Mr. Ambassador, you have virtually the entire world community ranged against you. It is an American game. At this point, I'm not looking through my goggles. I'm looking at the TV screen. I gave the code word, get some. Mr. Ambassador, we bid you good morning. Get some. AWAX play packed with computer equipment yes, helped control yes, the battle. I I my gun. Yes, Iraqi sir. soldiers ran through the crosshairs. Vietnam was a ghost yes, Gradually they are being starved quite apart from the aerial bombardment. Daybreak saw no letter. New targets were sought out. Some of those not destroyed overnight returned to. Allied aircraft have now flown a total of 4,000 sorties. Many people are dying at the moment, uh, Mr. Ambassador. 67 hit records have been banned by the BBC for reasons of sensitivity. Phil Collins, In the Air Tonight, Boom Bang a Bang by Lulu, and Cat Stevens, I'm Gonna Get Me a Gun. Yet the record most requested by our boys in the Gulf is Barry Maguire's The Eve of Destruction. What we cannot be proud of, Mr. Speaker, is the unshaven, shaggy-haired, drug culture, poor excuses for Americans wearing their tiny, round, wire-rimmed glasses, a protester symbol of the Blame America First crowd out in front of the White House burning the American flag. But the main development in the war is tonight's Scud missile attack on Israel. Saddam Hussein has now twice sent Scud, Scud, extremely dangerous Scud, weapons Scud, into the Scud, middle Scud, of a built-up area. Scud, Scud, most intense Scud, air attack Scud, since the Second Scud, World War. Scud, has now Scud, twice. The system dispenses Scud, hundreds of tiny bomblets. Has now Scud, twice. Allied planes have been over 8,000 sources. Scud, 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 has, Scud, now Scud, 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 has now twice. Scud, Scud, attacks on Baghdad, Tikrit, Samawa, Nasiriya and Basra. The electricity is gone off everywhere in the whole city. There's no water, no telephone. No communication for anybody. Military briefings have emphasized the threat still posed by Iraq's Scud missiles. 2,000 sorties a day. Scud targets, Scud launches, Scud launching sites, Scud missile attacks. Scud missiles, Scud rockets, Scud, Scud sites, Scud, 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 Scud sites, Scud rockets. No one has yet been killed in these Scud missile attacks. They're extremely inaccurate. Search for Scud. Three Scud, Scud missile launchers. Scud missiles, Scud missiles, Scud missiles, Scud missiles. They've now flown 10,000 soldiers. This first near is where the impact of the Scud was feeble, extremely frightening. 12,000 Allied soldiers. President Saddam Hussein, Scud rocket. Exert a powerful grip on the public imagination. We acknowledge Scuds are a weapon of terror. Saying that Scuds are a danger to your nation is like saying that lightning is a danger to your nation. Massive aerial bombing. More the merrier in terms of concentrated firepower, so that the war gave him the chemical weapons, military machines, the West, and the divergence between what the UN appears to be saying on paper and what the Allies are now saying in one form or another in reality. Security can scarcely be restored to this area with anything like the Iraqi war machine in the condition we saw in the last few days. Except if he withdraws from Kuwait and then says, I've withdrawn, that's it, you've done what you wanted, I'm out. I think that option has now virtually been exhausted. Our goal remains the same, to liberate Kuwait. This man has to comply with these resolutions without equivocation.
MPs won't be able to vote for an amendment supporting a ceasefire. Direct hit on two blocks of flats in Baghdad. says most of the civilian damage has been caused by the drugs and their defense missiles, which went astray. Television has done a beautiful job of demonstration of the high tech the Arabs will be buying in the next few years. As if incredibly accurate bombs and missiles don't do the same things to human beings as old fashioned teams. And F-16 has taken off with full weapon flows. At the rate of one every 90 seconds. I think it's really going well. If I had to say something bad, I'd say I wish the weather would be a little bit nicer right now. The 52s have already begun to bomb well-protected positions of the against the Republican Guard are being stepped up. 3,000 Allied soldiers as far as we can. The 52 bombers drop their bombs 30 times at a time in a three-mile-long strip. The effect of this on the Iraqi army is difficult to determine. The Allies are anxious. No one should be under the illusion that this will be an easy war to win. They kept talking about the elite Republican Guard in these hushed tones, like these guys were the bogeyman or something. Yeah, we're doing well now, but we have yet to face the elite Republican Guard. Like these guys were 12 feet tall desert warriors. Yeah, well, after two months of continuous carpet bombing and not one reaction at all from them, they became simply the Republican Guard. Not nearly as elite as we may have led you to believe. And after another month of bombing, they went from the elite Republican Guard to the Republican Guard to the Republicans Isn't in some respects the right of people to demonstrate in this way the right that they're fighting for in the Gulf? No, certainly not. That's a very confused statement of people's rights. They take the time of the police, the so-called demonstrators, and I don't understand what people should feel the need to do this because it is not gaining any political advantage at the time. It is causing a great deal of inconvenience. is a clear lead to the nation in prayer. B-52 bombers will launch raids against Iraq from Fairford in Gloucestershire because Middle East bases are too crowded. The Allied planes are returning time and time again, selecting new targets and finishing off old ones. 2,600 sorties to American B-52 targeting areas just five miles from the heart of the city, destroying the main power station. You're not seriously suggesting that such a building would be targeted, and that really is why I'm saying. The attacks are having a devastating effect. Day by day, more and more of Baghdad's infrastructure is being reduced to rubble. Target. It was a petrochemical plant. Power stations and energy producing facilities are being steadily obliterated. My Sintaf commander has now claimed air supremacy. They are using uh, high altitude bombing, and most of the civilians are paying the, the price. Pictures of maybe some of the bombs which hadn't been there. We're not going to innocent civilians. We're not going to go in there and kill a lot of civilians. The officials in the Western government are not telling the Every truth. Every night since the war began, Baghdad has been attacked at least once, and sometimes as many as four times. We also attacked power plants. One floor of the Iraq electrical generating facilities are completely inoperative, and another 50% suffered degraded operations. Prime Minister John Macon has rejected calls for negotiations. We have Cut off from regular food and water supplies as the Allies bombs began in mid January. We're doing our best to abide by the Geneva Convention. Hydroelectric installation in Iraq being bombed by the Americans. We're doing our best to abide by the Geneva Convention. A factory producing milk for children that was also attacked. We're doing our best to abide by the Geneva Convention. The Allies are including a number of food storage and processing plants in their strategic objectives. Inside a destroyed flour mill outside Baghdad. The ruins of a potato. Warehouse. We're doing our best to abide by the Geneva Convention. Allied strike planes have hit oil pumping stations. We're doing our best to abide by the Geneva Convention. More than a third of Iraq's communications network has gone. We're doing our best to abide by the Geneva Convention. The Allied determination to destroy Iraq's refining capacity. For thousands of all nuclear reactors have been destroyed. We're doing our best to abide by the Geneva Convention. The total oil spillage into the Gulf from attacks on offshore platforms could be eight times that spill from the Exxon Valdez. We're doing our best to abide by the Geneva Convention. In the city centre, the sound was deafening. Two bridges across the Tigris took direct hit. We're doing our best to abide by the Geneva Convention. The impact on civilians caught by the bombing is all too evident. I am annoyed at the propaganda coming out of Baghdad about targeting civilians. This has been fantastically accurate. 
Iraq's infrastructure has been bombed again and again. We're doing our best to abide by the Geneva Convention. The Sports Force has accepted that Allied bombing may be causing civilian casualties. Have we convinced enough now, but that bar no joke. Absolute precision is impossible to achieve. They can now move on. Without power and fuel, life-saving incubators are useless. Nor do we seek to punish the Iraqi people for the decisions and policies of their leaders. falling into some civilian areas of The Allied strategy to bombard and cripple the nation is close to completion. I'm now going to show you a picture of the luckiest man in Iraq. Keep your eye on the crosshairs. Right there. Right through the crosshairs. And now in his rearview mirror. <laughs> this is the only human being to have been shown by the Allies to the press. Government leaders around the world are following the course of the war on television. Where does the news come from? The pool system here is being manipulated they and deliberately misused by the military authorities to stifle information. The operational the facts have been omitted for reasons, for reasons of military, military security. security. Subject to clearance by, by the military, military authorities. Correspondents who visit the front on their own have been warned that they risk being shot by the Allies. Operation Desert Swarm, indeed, is unbracked. In the crowded air raid shelters, people try to make sense of the conflicting reports. Coalition superiority was overwhelming, but the airmen were running out of targets. Late in uh, January, we came to the lower part of the list. It wasn't high priority. The bunker in the Alfredus area of Baghdad. So this was a two-weapon salvo. This is not a video game. See where the blast and the fire would be, and they were pulling bodies out. The bunker was a public air raid shelter. On top of the water, there was about an inch of scum, a, a flesh, a boiled flesh, a burnt flesh. The bunker that was attacked last night was the military target. I lose my wife. I'm right to live It's not fair. Nobody, nobody says something. <laughs> Something's messed up. When the missile fell on the upper floor, the doors were closed because of the pressure of the bombing. The people had no way to go out. Two cold water containers as well as two boilers exploded. As uh, in the upper floor, people were burned to death. Here in the lower floor, people died in very high uh, degree of boiling water. Here you can see the water level which flooded the lower floor. On the walls, you can see the remains of hair of uh, human flesh and some parts of the body. Just imagine the feeling of the people who were boiled to death. Usually at 4 o'clock, they had to close the doors so that no more people would be accepted. So at least there was 1,000 or 200 people there. The Alfredo bunker hit. It was a major public relations and political problem. I mean, it stopped everything we were doing for about a day and a half. We wondered momentarily if, in fact, uh, there was some sort of a propaganda ploy. The guy in the States told him, are you sure that these bodies came from this bunker or were they gathered from other places to be put here so that you would film them? People told us that the British and the Americans were savages, animals and criminals. This man said that 11 of his family were in the shelter. People stopped using the shelters after what happened to Amri. Because what's the use? It is a demonstration in Iraq to an awful lot of Iraqis as to how vulnerable they really are. Did that incident have any effect on the conduct of the war? At the risk of sounding heartless, no. We'll bomb them till they're not there anymore. Oh, Munitions oh. factories are working overtime. Well, the United Nations gave the Allies the go-ahead to wage war. It is now powerless to stop it. We have the entire United Nations. Well, the official here, the public support.
support for the war may not be gunships designed to destroy tank columns were hunting down individuals. With regard to Saddam Hussein saying that he has met the best that the coalition has to offer, I would only say the best is yet to come. Increasing pressure the Israelis already doing so well, I think, the Iraq is destroyed, and there's a tremendous bonus for them. America. What we've seen so far is pretty phenomenal. Can we really go up a notch? Oh, yes, indeed. Our strategy to go after this army is very, very simple. First, we're going to cut it off, and then we're going to kill it. We have the power. We have the freedom. We have the intellect. We have the affluence. We can manifest our own destiny. The period of even more intense devastation, which the Allies now plan to set aside view of the world's biggest gun. Each shell weighs more than a ton. The Allied bombing of Iraq remains relentless. The United States has accused Iraq of war crimes. We have no reason to disbelieve the Pentagon version of the use of the fuel air bombs or the Nikon drops. The Allies argue Iraq needs to do more than simply comply with UN resolution. Even though Saddam Hussein has ordered his troops to withdraw from the West, the President called that an outrage. Saddam is not withdrawing, he was retreating. American airborne divisions and troops cut off the Republican Guard from any possibility. They're not a part of the same human race that the rest of us are. If they do withdraw against Iraq, they won't be attacked. We've made that perfectly clear. Iraq offers to abandon claims on Kuwait. America says that's not the purpose of the war. The the war, war continue with undiminished intensity. The men in the path of the Allied armor were hopelessly ill equipped. Soldiers are surrendering not just to Allied forces, he is a cameraman. Very reward now, American chocolate bars. Quite frankly, the United Nations doesn't matter anymore. Somebody said to me uh, a couple of hours ago that perhaps they should sell the building for the time being to the Japanese and they could turn it into a pizza parlor. We know that our cause is moral. We know that our cause is right. Peace can only be established now by getting Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. They needed to put some hate in their heart and go out and stop those son of a bitches from getting out of the way. We're not only willing to shoot and bomb people in the name of justice, but to help them. Iraqi yeah. forces yeah. are yeah. reported to be in concentrated on the main routes being used by Iraqi troops to withdraw. Withdraw. Retreat. Withdraw. Retreat. Let's settle for running away. The bombing Iraqi troops have already suffered is minor compared to what they've got coming. We're going to concentrate in the right. Lock, lock. Coming at you.
setting surrender or face starvation and certain death. Okay, stop the tape, please. It's been a great victory. We needn't be shy about it. And if I've got one message for the people at home today, it's this. Get out there and ring your church bells. once and for all. Let me describe briefly what happened. There were 114,000 separate aerial sorties in 42 days. That's one every 30 seconds. 88,000 tons of bombs were dropped. Only 7% of the bombs that fell upon Iraq were guided. 93% were free-falling bombs that hit where chance, necessity, and no free will took them. There were 38 aircraft lost by the United States in this slaughter. That number is less than the number of accidental losses in war games where no live ammunition is even used. No enemy aircraft rose to meet them. We know that. And no enemy anti-aircraft could reach them. And those who were there at the time know that. The United States claims to have lost 148 people. It concedes that the majority were from accident and friendly fire. There was not a single U.S. tank penetrated by an Iraqi missile. There was not a single B-52 downed by enemy fire. We had planes fly from Barksdale, Louisiana without ever touching the ground and return to Barksdale, Louisiana having killed thousands of people on the ground they never saw. And one of those facts that the enemy of truth was television telling us about the surgical strikes. And nobody gets hurt. We just turn the lights out. We use fuel air explosives and it incinerates people and it crushes people and we used it against civilians and military personnel. We had missiles fired from submarines in the eastern Mediterranean for sport, just to see how they worked. We had Tomahawk cruise missiles by the hundreds launched from the Persian Gulf, a couple of thousand miles from the places that they hit, totally out of range. We pulled a couple of old-fashioned battleships up there and dumped 2.1 million pounds of hot metal on southern Iraq around Basra and killing people with impunity. 
You remember General Kelly announced before the beginning of the so-called ground war. But there was no ground war. Name one battle. There wasn't a battle. There was a slaughter. General Kelly said when the troops finally moved forward, there are not many of them left alive to fight. And finally we learned that bulldozers and tanks with plows on the front came in and buried thousands, dead, wounded, and living. The Geneva Convention, written in the blood of millions and millions of people who died in World War II. And the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States Army, when asked how many casualties he thought we had inflicted on Iraqi military and civilians, said, frankly, that's not a figure I'm very much interested in. 48 hours after the ceasefire, on the direct order of General Schwarzkopf, as we know, major assaults occurred that took thousands of more lives. We killed at least 125,000 soldiers. We've killed to date more than 130,000 civilians. We killed as many as we dared. The country they liberated, Kuwait, and the aggressor country, Iraq, are both tonight in a worsening state of chaos. This is the first sight of the uprising that's raging inside Iraq. The lightly armed rebels can demonstrate defiance of Saddam Hussein, but their leaders accept they have little chance of toppling him unless they can get outside help. I think the whole of sanctions should stay while Saddam Hussein is in power because the Iraqi people have to have an incentive to stand up to him and get him out. The opposition within the country, of course, listened to the West and rose against Saddam Hussein only to be confronted by the United States in particular helping Saddam Hussein against them. They actually stopped rebels from reaching arms depots. They flew over his helicopters as his helicopters attacked them. They gave his Republican guards safe passage through their lines to attack the rebels. They did everything except join the fight on his side. But if you're going to sustain cheap and plentiful supplies of oil, you've got to have a regime there to ensure that you can provide it. A special United Nations envoy is warning that Iraq is facing a catastrophe unless food and fuel are allowed into the country. You asked me to travel, as a matter of urgency, to Iraq. It should be said at once that nothing we had seen or read had prepared us for the devastation which has befallen the country. Most means of modern life have been destroyed. The authorities are as yet scarcely able to measure the dimensions of the calamity, much less respond to its consequences. The conflict has wrought near apocalyptic results. Iraq has been relegated to a pre-industrial age. You people didn't leave anything that you did not target your planes on it. Everything was bombed. Schools, churches, mosques, roads, the factories, farms, homes, everything. And throughout day and night, day and night, the bombing continued. Cats were frightened. And their noises with the planes, it was something very disturbing. It brought everything ugly to your imagination. And I think this is the real war. To prevent future wars and to maintain American influence, many more arms must be sold to these countries in the years ahead. When you're dealing with friends and allies, if you provide the equipment, you have a uh, string on it, which means that you probably can
contaminate their thinking with your values. You people watched us. You people watched our country being demolished. You watched us in your living room through the gun sight cameras. Without asking any question, where do these bombs fall? Article 48 of the Geneva Convention states, It is prohibited to attack, destroy, remove or render useless objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population. And this is precisely what was the target of many of our smart bombs. We must ask ourselves, did the war have to be fought in this way? The same question was put to a Pentagon planner. What were we trying to do with the sanctions? Help out the Iraqi people? No. What we were doing with the attacks on the infrastructure was to accelerate the effect of sanctions. In April, new Security Council resolutions were tabled. A UN Special Commission, UNSCOM, was given unprecedented power to seek and destroy Iraq's weapons capability. Sanctions levied to force a withdrawal from Kuwait would now be used to ensure Iraq's compliance with UNSCOM. Sanctions are now, in these new circumstances, a vital lever in making sure that Iraq complies with her international obligations. The time has come to try to change the destructive pattern of military competition and proliferation in this region and to reduce arms flow. But even as James Baker was speaking, elsewhere in the administration, very different plans were being laid. The post-war arms deal to the Gulf states worth between 50 and 150 billion dollars. We will also still be controlling the economic sanctions and in particularly preventing the export of oil. In other words, Iraq cannot recover from this war with that situation. I saw a baby with um, a big tummy and uh, legs like a six. His mouth was bleeding, his hair was falling. We were just shocked because we didn't saw such a thing before. We asked, what's this case? They said, this is a question of court. Children who get to this stage of nutritional deprivation are found throughout all of Iraq and rarely survive. Kwashiakor had not been seen in Iraq for three decades. The Security Council removed foodstuffs from the list of embargoed items and established a sanctions committee to screen goods coming into Iraq. Food and medicine were now officially exempt, but... How do you buy the food? How do you pay for it? If they freeze your assets and they don't permit you to export, where do you get the money to buy it? That's a fallacy. The West is playing on words. In July, a second UN envoy warned that without $7 billion of aid, Iraq faced massive starvation. The Security Council offered a single oil sale of $1.6 billion, of which two-thirds would be paid to Kuwait. The Iraqi government rejected the terms. It was, a Bush official said, a good way to maintain the bulk of sanctions and not be on the wrong side of a potentially emotive issue. By the end of the year, 100,000 civilians had died.
can now argue that he has fulfilled most of the United Nations requirements of him and cooperated with their weapons inspectors while his country suffers the torment of sanctions. In April 93, a showdown with UNSCOM led to new Allied bombing. Within months, UN inspectors had announced that their work was all over. But the Security Council now demanded long-term surveillance. Until that was in place, sanctions would stay. A UNICEF report detailed the consequences. Sanctions have led to a virtual collapse of healthcare, water supply, and sanitation. Politically motivated sanctions cannot be implemented in a way that spares the vulnerable. The report was shelved. The sanctions against Iraq is affecting everybody in Iraq. It's affecting the Arabs as much as the Kurds. It's affecting the pro-Saddam forces and it's affecting the anti-Saddam. It's affecting the pro-Western, it's affecting the anti-Western. There is no one exempted from the sanction. The sanctions are on the whole country. The government ration now supplied only two-thirds of energy requirements and lacked vital nutrients. Malnutrition amongst children was widespread and lowered resistance to disease. Dysentery, cholera, and typhoid, eradicated before the war, were epidemic. With medical imports cut by 90%, Iraq's once high-tech health service was unable to cope. If you see our hospitals, we are complaining of shortage in everything, and I mean it everything. Medical staff were forced to choose. Which child shall have medicine? Which child shall be left to die? An Iraqi doctor wrote, for children with leukemia to begin treatment, families sell their belongings and even their homes. And after bringing in the drugs from Jordan, the children are dying from uncontrolled infection. Two thirds of children in a psychiatric survey did not believe they would survive to adulthood. They were trapped within their trauma and unable to escape time seems to have stopped. I was just asking my uh, little boy, he's seven years old. He is scared every time he hears a, a, a noise. He thinks, well, where's the rocket? The kids really are shattered. Children from poorer families were forced out of school to work or to beg. What will they do in the future if a child of 13 or 14 years old leaves school now? What will become of them? In July, the United Nations World Food Programme warned that 20 million Iraqis were now simply engaged in a struggle for survival. Yet the sanctions committee banned essential items on the grounds that they were dual use. Wheelchairs, because aluminium is used in aircraft wings. Angina tablets, because they contain nitroglycerin. Midwifery kits, because scissors might be melted down to make bullets. For lack of drugs, women bled to death after childbirth. Caesarean sections had to be endured without anesthetic. Many babies were born premature and underweight. Their mothers, too malnourished to breastfeed, had nothing to give them but sugar and tea. In September 1994, the government was forced to halve the ration as food stocks failed. 400,000 children were estimated to have died since the war, and future generations had been condemned to pay the highest price of all, the integrity of their DNA. For the very first time in that war, the British and American military used a new and devastating weapon. It has left in its wake on and around the battlefields radioactive and highly toxic dust that lasts for over four billion years. Depleted uranium rounds fired by the Allies had left over 300 tons of dust blowing across the sands with each new desert storm into the water, into the food chain. 
the rise in cancer was unprecedented. But is the position even worse than first fear? That the weapons we use may also be responsible for a new wave of birth defects. Midwives have been coping with birth deformities they've never seen before. to end the embargo, but Britain and America resisted. The US ambassador to the UN, Madeleine Albright, described sanctions as one of the most powerful weapons in our armory and was adamant that they should stay. We have heard that half a million children have died. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. The U.S. proposed the Oil for Food program. Iraq could sell $4 billion of oil a year. A third would be paid as compensation to Kuwait, the remainder used by the U.N. to buy humanitarian supplies. Russian and French diplomats dismissed the move as a public relations tool. In September, the World Food program reported, we are at the point of no return in Iraq. People have exhausted their ability to cope. In May 96, the regime accepted the terms of the Oil for Food program. The Iraqi people waited 10 months for the first shipment to arrive. 125 tons of chickpeas. By April 97, of 2,000 applications submitted to the Sanctions Committee, only 284 had been approved. 40 contracts on the World Health Organization's priority list were blocked by the Americans, as were consignments of beans, cooking oil, and rice. In September 1998, the coordinator of the program, Dennis Halliday, resigned in protest. The oil for food program, as conceived, is completely inadequate. It was designed, in fact, not to resolve the situation, but simply to prevent further deterioration of both the mortality rates and malnutrition. It has failed to do that. At best, it perhaps has just about sustained the situation. Sanctions do nothing but target civilians, innocent civilians. In fact, in the case of Iraq, it's targeting children, 40% of whom were not born when Kuwait was invaded. There was worse to come. After seven years of inspections, relations between the Iraqi administration and UNSCOM broke down. This is not a UN commission. It has been turned into an American agency with the support of the British. British and American planes ready to attack as the inspectors were pulled out of Baghdad. On December the 18th, Prime Minister Tony Blair stood in front of his Christmas tree to announce that the bombing had begun. What do you want the Iraqi children to think? How are they supposed to believe that friendship is possible with the world? Animals in the West are treated much better than him. The other day there was a child who said to me, I wish I was born a dog in America. It was a four-day intensive aerial bombardment of selected targets inside Iraq. But where did the target information come from? The CIA ran an unauthorized eavesdropping operation against the Iraqis from UNSCOM's office in Baghdad, and information collected by the spies was used by the British and the Americans to pinpoint targets in the Desert Fox airstrikes on Iraq. continued into the next century, as did sanctions. The United States killed UNSCOM. And without UNSCOM, the conditions for lifting the embargo could not be met. After six months in office, Dennis Halliday's replacement, Hans von Sponnick, was in despair. 
Iraq now has an estimated national debt of $190 billion. Right now, we are setting the stage for depriving another generation of opportunity to become responsible national and international citizens of tomorrow. And it's not a passive thing, it's not neglect, it's an active decision-making process of the member states of the Security Council. They know what they're doing. They know we own their country. We dictate the way they live and talk. And that's what's great about America right now. Especially when there's all that oil out there we need. In October, Secretary General Kofi Annan accused America of deliberately disrupting the oil for food program upon which millions of people depend for their survival. Four months later, Hans von Sponnick resigned. There is a much wider design here where Iraq fits somewhere, but the experiment is over. And we should never apply this kind of thing to any other country again, because we have seen that this experiment fails in human terms. For nearly a decade, the United Nations agencies dedicated to health, development, and the protection of children had meticulously documented the results of the experiment. In the name of justice and international law, the governments of the Security Council had overseen the pitiless destruction of a nation without condemnation or outcry from their own citizens. Here you are killing hundreds and hundreds of thousands and nobody cares. It was as if the world has built a Berlin Wall of silence all around Iraq. One in four children were now slowly starving. Physically and intellectually stunted, these children will never recover. Why? So that the multinationals could get our oil. We would have sold our oil anyway. It's useless to anybody to be kept in the land. Others have already paid the price in full. There's no other way to describe the death of one, possibly 1.5 million people, to describe the death of thousands of kids each month, to describe the death of probably 600,000 children since 1990. What else is that but genocide? It's a war. It's malnutrition. It's lack of medicine. Why? Twenty centuries after the birth of Christ, George Bush addressed U.S. air crews running bombing missions over Iraq. I am delighted, he told them, that I've been invited out here today to salute you, who, in my view, are doing the Lord's work. Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down. The sanction committee does not even respect the right of the dead to be buried according to the Islamic rules. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day. Because the UN Sanction Committee prohibited Iraq from importing shroud clothes. Death and mourning and famine. We say in our culture that the only belonging that you take with you when you die is a foreyard of a shroud. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And that new end is depriving our people. They want them to go up naked. Think the 
there is a much wider design here. We think the price is worth it. What else is that but genocide? We think the price is worth it. Depriving another generation. We think the price is worth it. And that's what's great about America right now. We think the price is worth it. They know what they're doing. Doing the Lord's work. We think the price is worth it. And nobody cares. Why? think the price is worth it? There is a much wider design here. We think the price is worth it? Depriving another generation. We think the price is worth it? What else is there but genocide? We think the price is worth it? Why? They know what they're doing. We think the price is worth it? Doing the Lord's work. We think the price is worth it? Why? We think the price is worth it. And nobody cares. We think the price is worth it. Why? We think the price is worth it. Why? There's a much wider design here. The president of Serbia, the largest republic in Yugoslavia, has said that he no longer accepts the authority of the country's ruling presidential council. The statement from Mil Slobodan Milosevic came as his fellow communists mounted a demonstration in the capital of Belgrade.